praise God for each one of you all that are here this morning uh, in person. I praise God for everybody that's joining us online. Let's make them feel welcome this morning, too. God bless you. We love you. So glad that you're here. Uh, we we want to pray God's blessings over everybody gathered online, too. Uh, but God's already met us right here in the testimony of the worship, had me. And I just praise God for uh, for his uh, His faithfulness and his, and his blessing. Wow. Uh, powerful Sunday school, Teresa. Thank you for sharing that. Um, as we get started, I wonder if you all could uh, open uh, with me as the Lord taught us to pray together. So let's do this this morning, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this time that we can share with you, Lord. I pray as we open your word, Lord, that you would say exactly what you want to say, that you would speak to every heart, every mind in here. Holy Spirit, that you continue to have your way through this service, Lord, that you would multiply it for your glory, for your kingdom. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Beloved, I've got a whale of a tale to tell you this morning. I've got a whale of a tale. Our source text is going to be found in the book of Jonah. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn there to the book of Jonah. And we'll be looking at chapter 1 starting out. In fact, over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be going over the entire book of Jonah together. And uh, it, it, we're going to see how it plugs into our life of discipleship. How many of you know that there are several messages right in the book of Jonah dealing with discipleship? Who knows that? If you didn't, you're going to find out because it does. Look at your neighbor and say, it does. Yes. A lot of people tend to miss some of the biggest points in the book of Jonah because all they think about is the large fish encounter. I'm doing so. Sadly, some will miss the wonderful opportunities of seeing the nature and the graciousness and the patience of our Heavenly Father when it comes to His dealing with us. Our Heavenly Father, He is sovereign, isn't He? Amen. Now, we don't hear that enough in our churches these days, do we? But it is true. Look at your neighbor and say, yep, that's true too. For example, a few weekends ago, everyone was busy making plans, right? I was, I was at the factory working. We were making plans about how we were going to build this and that with our trailers. Uh, no doubt there were people in other places that were working at the same time, or there were people that might have been shopping, I would assume, and probably hanging out at the house, just planning their weekend out. Everyone was making plans on how their day was going to go and how their plans were going to be. And then, somebody say then, yeah. a very powerful storm system moved into town. Then all of a sudden just came right in and all the plans that everyone was making came to a grinding halt because we were strongly advised to seek shelter at a potential tornado that might have been in the area. Now, thankfully, the storm moved through the area uh, with minimal damage. There was some damage, but it wasn't as bad as what it could have been. And those moments before, during, and after that storm hit, I, I, I have to think that people were reminded that no matter how much they work or how much they plan or how much they build, no matter, no matter how many times they may try to convince themselves to the contrary, the plain truth of the matter is that like it or not, we're not in control of much of anything, are we? Or not. You know, that power, that power, that ultimate power resides firmly in the grasp of Almighty God. And does. And the firmly in the grasp of Almighty God, the one who holds the whole world in his hands. He's the one that created animals. He's the one that created people and stars and planets and a seemingly infinite number of galaxies with a word. With a word. That's who's in control, beloved. It's his kingdom come. It is his will being done. Amen? And he is so incomprehensibly, infinitely powerful that our little brains could not even hope to fully grasp the depth and the magnitude even the full expanse of his power instead we just catch glimpses of it every now and again or maybe it's in a powerful storm or maybe it's when we stand next to the ocean or maybe it's when we get a clear view of the vastness and the beauty of a starlit night sky 
those moments when we come face to face with our own limitations and his limitless power. Beloved, he is sovereign. Amen. He is mighty. He is God. Amen. And we obviously are not. Right? And yet with all of that in mind, I read and I'm reminded of the verse right out of his word to our hearts in 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I say glory to God for that. Now, many of you heard, have heard me reference this verse before, and I'll say it again and again to my dying day. I can't help it because it's part of my story. It's part of my testimony. It's part of my song because he's been so patient, so faithful, so loving with me. Can I get a witness to that? Anybody ever experienced that? Now, when I, I read this account of Jonah, and I'm reminded of the times in my life when I ran from God. I'm reminded of the times when God forgave me and restored me and set me back on the path that I was meant to be, the path that I should have been in the first place. And I would dare say that maybe in this room, maybe for those gathered online, that I'm not alone in this experience. Right. Right. But he's so faithful and he's so patient and he's so loving. And we're reminded of that all the way through the book of Jonah. And first, we're going to take a look at Jonah himself. So we look at chapter 1 today, and we're getting into Jonah chapter 1, and we start at verse 1 right here. If you have your Bibles, look at this with me. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. And he went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Whoops. One of the things we first see here is that God is concerned with and he cares about all people. And to that I say amen, right? Amen. Not just his chosen ones that we they might have known at that time, but uh, everyone. And he is being patient in dealing with the Ninevites. The Ninevites of all people, the Ninevites and Jonah too. So let's suffice it to say that it probably took Jonah by surprise to hear that God wanted him to bring a message to the people who obviously were not Israelites. And sometimes I try to imagine what that conversation must have gone like between Jonah and the Lord. I can hear the Lord speaking to Jonah and saying, Jonah, I've got a job for you. And I can see Jonah saying, yes, Lord. And I, can say, and I can hear God saying to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to prophesy to my people. And Jonah said, yes, Lord. And God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And he said, what? Uh, what? <laughs> jo Jonah doesn't like that at all. And to be perfectly honest, well, it's kind of understandable because the Ninevites are not described in the scriptures as a savory people. They're not. The descriptions of Nineveh in the Bible are absolutely not pretty. They're just not pretty. I'm going to keep that as clean as I can. They're not pretty. Nineveh had the reputation in the ancient world as being a sinless and a lawless place. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, Nineveh was nasty. Nineveh was nasty. And I seriously doubt, I seriously doubt that Nineveh was on Jonah's top 10 list of places to prophesy. I don't think it was a desired location for him. In fact, Jonah, he didn't want to go because that wasn't part of his plan. So Jonah decided to run away. He wanted to get as far away from Nineveh and from God as he possibly could. And Nineveh was located east of Israel, so Jonah went west, way west. Somebody say way west. Way. If you look at the map, we're, we're aiming about 2,000 miles the wrong way across the Mediterranean. Tarshish is just about the furthest west it was possible to go at that time. Uh, it was located somewhere around Spain through the Straits of Gibraltar. And even in the ancient world, they kind of, some people thought that was the end of the world. So Jonah, he runs away from God, and he runs away from God's calling on his life, but there's something we need to learn about God just because we stop pursuing God, even run away from him sometimes, that doesn't mean that he stops pursuing us. I'm going to get an amen on that one. I'm so glad. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you so glad for that, that he is faithful, even in the moments where we might tend to stray and go places we should not 
And there's that old Wesleyan term, that prevenient grace once again. Hmm. That preventing grace, that grace that gives us a nudge. Somebody say nudge, nudge when we need it. Anybody ever need a nudge from the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we need a nudge from the Holy Spirit. And if you don't think you do, he might be nudging you right now, okay? We need that nudge from the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to our source text here and see what happens. In verse 4, we read, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and they cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And the captain went to him, and he said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. God continued to pursue Jonah, even on his way from God. In verse 4, we read that God sent a violent storm, that he rocked the boat, so to speak. Anybody ever had their boat rocked? Oh, Boy, I have. It's important to note also in this passage that if he wanted to, God could have just destroyed the boat and sank it and drowned everybody if he wanted to, but he didn't, did he? Because he's faithful, because he's loving, because he's not wanting any to perish, but to come to repentance you see, God wasn't punishing Jonah here. God was trying to get Jonah's attention. Somebody say attention. 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 God was trying to get his attention. He knew Jonah was running away. He was holed up sleeping in the bottom of a boat. This wasn't a surprise to him. God didn't have to put a microchip on him to track him. He knew exactly where he was. But he was essentially telling Jonah, you may be running but I'm God and I'm not done with you yet. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose for you, son, and you're not listening. Do I have your attention now? Do I have your attention now? Have you ever been in a situation like that? You know what God wants you to do. You know what he wants you to do. You know where God wants you to go, but you decide to do the opposite. Anybody ever been there? Boy, I have. Sure. And then your life, it just doesn't seem to work right, does it? Despite all your best laid plans, it seems to be a mess, doesn't it? A lot of people, they, they think that God is punishing them for their disobedience, but honestly, it's probably because of their own ignorance, if I'm just being nice about it. And then they have the nerve to get all huffy and puffy with Almighty God. Of all people, Almighty God, they get all huffy and puffy with, with them, but did you ever stop to think, that maybe God is calling out to us at that moment and saying, I'm not done with you yet, son. I'm not done with you yet, daughter. So maybe instead of us getting all huffy and puffy with God, maybe we should be better off to work out our salvation with fear and trembling Amen. before an almighty God with humility, Amen. with reverence before where, who it belongs to. Beloved, realize that you are drawing breath this morning. Somebody take a deep breath this morning. Ah, realize that if, if you are drawing breath this morning, that God is not done with you yet. Look at your neighbor and say, God's not done with you yet. And we need to ask ourselves the question, are we running away from God? Have you heard his call in your life, but you're running in the opposite direction? Does it feel like a storm is rocking your boat this morning? Maybe Maybe, just maybe, God is calling out to you and telling you this morning that he's not done with you yet. And he's got plans for you. Your best laid plans are found in his hands and the maker of the universe. Are you listening to him this morning? Amen. Let's look at verse 7. Starting back at verse 7. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on, guess who? Jonah. And they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? Where is your country? And what? And for what people are you? In verse 9 now, he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had told them so. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? And look at Jonah's response. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not 
For the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And they made vows to him. Verse 17, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So Jonah realized that all these things were happening because he was running away from God. And so he surrendered himself to the sailors, and they, he told them to just throw him overboard. And the sailors resisted at first, trying even harder to get the land, but at the end they just had to give in. They had to. They realized that they were dealing with a much more powerful force than anything they could muster. And so they did. They threw Jonah into the sea and they prayed that God wouldn't punish them. And I want you to notice the significance of this moment. I was actually talking to Sharon about this earlier this week. Uh, the, the significance of this moment, these were pagan fishermen, okay? They were praying to other gods. But at the end of this, who were they praying to? Almighty God. Because they witnessed God working in Jonah's life in spite of his hard heart in spite of his stiff neck behavior the fear of the Lord still sees these hardened crusty sailors and they repented and they believed in God because it's his kingdom come because it's his will being done amen, amen. beloved it's important to note that bad choices on our part often lead to bad results who knows that is that a surprise to anyone we shouldn't go around blaming God for the way that our lives turn around, turn about because 95% of the time or more, it's decisions that we've made that went right against Almighty God. It's choices that we made that led us into that belly of that fish, so to speak. Even when Jonah relented and he gave in to God, there were still consequences for his behavior. He was still thrown into the sea and as far as he and the sailors knew, he was going to die. It's what he thought. Just because we repent doesn't mean that we are free from the consequences of our choices. Now, I believe with all my heart that God will see us through these things, just like he sees Jonah through. But there are still consequences to the choices that we make. And we have no right to be angry at an almighty God. Adam and Eve, because of their choices, they were still cast out of the garden. Moses, because of a few choices he made, was not allowed to enter the promised land. Israel, because of their collective choices, they were sent into exile, weren't they? But the consequence is they don't get to have the final word. Oh, and I praise God for that because he is patient in dealing with us. Because he's not willing that any should perish. Amen? Yes, Jonah was thrown overboard, seemingly to his death, but God wasn't done with Jonah yet. Somebody say, not yet. Not yet. Verse 17 says that God appointed or prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Well, we don't know what kind of great fish it was. It was a big fish. Somebody say, big fish. Big fish. Because he was patient in dealing with Jonah, just like he was patient in dealing with us. God had a plan and a purpose for his life, just like he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And the question we need to ask ourselves from this text this morning is, are we humble? Are we repentant before an almighty God this morning? And are we seeking his face? And I pray that the answer is yes. I pray that it is yes. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, we read, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Hmm. Let's take this home this morning. Really think about that. I wonder if God is trying to get your attention this morning. I wonder if God is trying to get your attention this morning. And if he is, beloved, are you listening? Are you listening to him or are you trying to run from him? God has a call on each one of our lives. Are we answering that call? Are we listening to the creator's voice? The one who made 
the sun, the moon, the stars, the one who made the animals and people with the word, who has all the power at his fingertips and yet is so patient with you. Are you listening to him this morning? Are you doing your own thing? Are you running 2,000 miles in the wrong direction? Hmm. Is God rocking your boat? Because if he isn't now, he might be pretty soon. Are you asleep in that boat? I pray that you're awake. I pray that you're awake. I pray that you're listening. I pray that you're well, willing and ready to stand up and step out. Now next week, we're going to look at what God is going to do, do with our buddy uh, Jonah. But for right now, let's allow God to do an examining work in our hearts as we stand and we pray this morning. In closing here, let's stand and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. Oh, we praise you, Father, for the gift of your word. I pray, Lord, that you would just search our hearts. We want to honor you, Father, in everything that we do. We praise you for your salvation. We praise you for your sanctification, Lord. And I yes, pray that you yes. would just do a work through us, through and through, by your Holy Spirit's power. If we're holding anything back from you, yes, Lord. that you would yes. search it out, that you would root it out. Yes. Any yes. obstacles between us and you, between us and the call that you've placed on our lives, Lord, I pray that you would just yes. remove those obstacles. Yes. And that you'd help us to be the sons and the daughters that you've created us to be. We love you this morning. Yes. Oh, we praise your holy name this morning. Amen. And for any soul that is reaching online, Father, that maybe has never cried out to you before, but wants to know who this awesome and powerful God is that, that saves us, that sanctifies us, Lord, I pray that you'd just speak to them. You'd speak to them and you'd, you'd lead them to your knee, their knees, Father, that they would repent before you and Almighty God, that they would admit that they're a sinner, they would believe on you, Lord Jesus, and confess you as Lord. Oh, I thank you and I praise you, Father, for your goodness. I thank you for Amen. meeting us right here this morning. I pray that even as we go from this place, that you would continue to keep this message on our hearts and our minds, that we would think about what it means to be humble before you, what it means to seek you out in each and every step of the way, because we need you, Lord, and we know that you're faithful, and we praise you, and we thank you for it. We pray all of these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. 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 And beloved, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. The Lord amen. turn his face toward you and give amen. you peace. I love you guys. Have a wonderful week. God bless each one of you. God bless you online. You're dismissed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. amen.